about what's referred to as a myocardial infarction. Somebody tell me what that stands for. Muscle. Dead muscle. Dead muscle, yes. Which is, what do we call this? Heart attack. Excellent. Or an MI is what you call it in the hospital. So what the heck causes this muscle to die? Okay, so now, if we looked in the aorta, okay, inside the aorta there is a small opening. So as blood goes out to the body, some of the blood also goes through this opening and out to the coronary arteries that surround the heart. And it feeds the heart muscle. But of course, sometimes the coronary arteries can be blocked. So we have plaque buildup in the coronary arteries. And of course, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and stroke are the number one killers in the United States. I mean, when COVID was going on, we had so many deaths that COVID kind of superseded that, but it has calmed down. And so now we're back to woo -hoo, cardiovascular disease being a big issue. So we've kind of talked about this a little bit in the class, um, but something else which is uh, very interesting is that when you look at blood vessels, and specifically blood vessels in the heart, these blood vessels are going around the heart muscle. So there are a lot of curves to these blood vessels, okay? A lot of curvature as it goes around the heart. And this could be one of the reasons why coronary arteries seem to get clogged faster than other arteries. Like you don't hear about clogs in the arteries in your thigh, okay? It just doesn't happen that often. But that's because there's so many curves to these arteries. So now if you can imagine, you have red blood cells and white blood cells and other chemicals that are moving through these arteries. When we talk about plaque in the arteries, plaque in the arteries all start from the same thing. There is destruction of the lining of the arteries, okay? Now that lining is referred to as the endothelium. Now it's a super smooth lining. It is slick. Nothing sticks to it. As a matter of fact, it's slicker than Teflon. You know that stuff in your frying pans? You buy a Teflon coated pan so you can cook an egg in it and the egg just slides right out. Uh, we know that it's slicker than Teflon because they've tried to produce artificial hearts that are lined with Teflon. And Teflon is not slick enough. Platelets and other things can stick to Teflon. But endothelium, they can't stick to it. That lining is super smooth, super slick. Except, what happens if the lining tears? Now imagine this lining tears, and when it does, underneath the lining, it isn't so slick. It's even stickier than Teflon. So, if I rip the inside lining in any way, <coughs> things can start sticking. And it seems to be that wherever the curvature is, it seems to rip more often somewhere right around here. And I always kind of say, okay, think about like, have you ever watched a, a NASCAR race or, you know, Indianapolis 500 where the cars are going around the track? Where are they most likely to skid out and hit the wall? Well, as they come around the curve, right? It's the same thing here. So let's think about this. What if I have a patient who has high blood pressure, for instance? High blood pressure, high heart rate, the red blood cells are moving really fast. So they're like those NASCAR, okay? And now instead of only going 50 miles an hour around the curve, they're moving so fast they're going 150 miles an hour around the curve. Now these red blood cells can come around and they start hitting the wall. And the red blood cells themselves can tear the endothelial lining. Now, white blood cells, when the endothelial lining is torn, they don't like it. And they want to heal it. And they think, huh, 
how can we heal that lining? Oh, I know. Let's bring in a whole bunch of cholesterol and let's bring in a whole bunch of fat and we'll kind of use it like putty, you could say, and we'll try to put it underneath the wall, not actually on the wall, but we'll dig underneath the wall of the red blood or the uh, blood vessel and we'll start to try to heal it from the inside and fix where it's torn. But it, it doesn't work so well because as they're doing that, what we start to see is where it tore, you start to see these kind of bumps in the red blood cell and in here is where the white blood cells are with all the fat and the cholesterol. Now look what just happened to the size of your blood vessel. It narrowed. It got a little bit smaller. And my red blood cells are still going 150 miles an hour around the curve. And guess what happens when it narrows? When I narrow the racetrack, the likelihood is those red blood cells are going to crash and burn even better and faster. Now the other interesting thing is I can also, not only by increasing the speed of the red blood cells, increasing blood pressure, increasing heart rate, not only can I tear the endothelial lining, but increasing the amount of carbohydrates I have in my diet. Too many candy bars, too many sodas, all that kind of good stuff, and that can scrape and tear the endothelial lining. And I get the same thing. I get the white blood cells coming in and trying to fix this. And by the way, it can get so bad that more and more white blood cells come in and they keep trying to fix it and the bump where the white blood cells are located with all the cholesterol and all the fat gets larger. And this is what we call plaque. Now we can barely get the red blood cells through this small opening. And because the opening is blocked, we call this blockage an occlusion, or it's occluded. And I can have 95% blockage, 100% blockage. Oh, and by the way, this wall also is very weak. It's not as strong as it used to be. It's weakened by all those white blood cells, and it's weakened by all that fat and cholesterol, and it can actually explode. And I can have a ruptured artery, which is very typically what happens in our brain. You get an artery that ruptures, and now we have a stroke. They don't rupture so often in the heart, although they can. Most of the time, they just close off. And now you have that occlusion. And because I'm not getting all the blood flow, I can't deliver oxygen to all those myocardial cells, those muscle cells, and the muscle cells begin to die. If a muscle cell in the heart dies, the heart cannot contract as well. And if you don't have that good contraction, you can't move the blood to the lungs, you can't move the blood to the body, and your patient can die from the heart attack. Questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you repeat what the white blood cells brought that made the plaque? They bring fat and cholesterol. So it's not that you're eating all the fat and cholesterol. It's actually that your white blood cells are using the fat and cholesterol to try to patch and fix what has already been destroyed. And anything that causes the blood cells to move faster or anything that causes the blood vessel to get smaller, stress, cigarettes, caffeine, there's all kinds of things that cause constriction of your blood vessels. Anything that causes what we call that vasoconstriction can cause a more difficult time for those red blood cells, white blood cells to get around the corner and it could potentially tear that endothelial lining. So what would cause it to, you know, you said the white blood cells they, they patch it up, but what would cause it to get a break, like a, a tear? In the beginning? Yeah. It could be due to high blood pressure. It oh, could be good. due to, uh, usually the number one reason is because of vasoconstriction, okay? Um, and the number two reason is because of excess carbohydrates in your diet, which we all have way too many of. Cholesterol is fat-soluble, but it's not the same as fat. Is it different? Yes. 
It is a type of fat. So would like the white blood cells building the plaque be comparable to like the positive feedback of the red blood cells like with platelets and clotting kind of thing? Um, yeah, you could compare it to that. Wouldn't officially be a positive feedback, but yeah, I get what you're saying. They're going to keep coming mm -hmm. to try to continue okay. to fix it. Yeah. What other type of fat is it besides cholesterol that's going there? Saturated fat? Just, okay. Yeah. And they're both there to try to heal that blood vessel. That's the whole idea, is to try to heal it. Because we know if you have any type of other injuries, like to skin or to other internal organs, cholesterol and fats are going to be added to that to try to heal. It's like, I don't know if you've ever had like scars on your skin or anything like that. They tell you to put vitamin E oil. Well, that is a type of fatty substance. And that is the reason they tell you to do stuff like that, is to help with the healing process. other questions? Alright, so one other thing I want to go through, just real quick, and by the way, the, the plaque in the arteries, a lot of times you'll hear people refer to this as atherosclerosis, okay, and that's the plaque, and uh, we've talked about in class the omega-3 fatty acids, those are used to help to dissolve that plaque out of the artery, so a lot of times the, the cardiologist will recommend to their patients to take fish oil pills, and those fish oil pills are filled with those omega-3 fatty acids. However, if that isn't going to work, then what they're going to do is probably go in and um, uh, try to clean those arteries out. They'll do some surgical intervention and try to get the arteries to be cleaned out. And hopefully, once somebody's arteries are cleaned out, uh, you can get them on a better diet. And by the way, exercise is really good at helping to heal plaque in the arteries. Exercise brings all kinds of nutrients to this. The problem is for your patients, if the occlusion is too great, exercise may be too much for them because they're not getting enough oxygen to the body. So you want to be exercising prior to getting those clocks to try to keep the clog out. Is that the surgery where they kind of go through your mouth? No, uh, usually what they're going to do is they're going to go with a, a catheter up through the femoral artery and then thread it up through the femoral artery and into the aorta and from the aorta thread it into the coronary artery that's blocked and then what they do is they open up, uh, at the tip of that catheter is a balloon and they open up the balloon and they try to push open that artery. Uh, and then a lot of times what they'll do is at the end of the balloon also is like a metal mesh. And they put that metal mesh and it goes all the way around the artery to keep it open. That's what they call a stint in the artery. And so, that, yeah, that's, that's what they're going to be doing. Percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as coronary angioplasty, opens narrowed coronary arteries. In this procedure, doctors insert a long, thin tube called a catheter in an artery in the groin or wrist and thread it to the affected artery using x-ray imaging. Doctors then inject a small amount of dye through the catheter to the artery to help them see any blockages or narrowing on x-ray images. A catheter with a balloon on the tip is then inserted through the first catheter and guided to the heart. When the catheter reaches the narrowed or blocked area of the artery in the heart, doctors inflate the balloon to reopen the artery and improve blood flow. The balloon is then deflated and removed. In most cases, doctors then insert another catheter with a mesh tube attached called a stent. The stent is then placed in the narrowed area of the artery to prevent re-narrowing after the artery is widened doctors then remove the catheter.